Now let's look at the early church fathers. And I'm telling you, we've got a lot of quotes here. And I want to tell the producer that probably what I'm going to do is go ahead and write into this and just keep this flowing if we can because I don't want to break these quotes up. We'll just go right on through with this. The early church fathers, the Antinocene Fathers, volume 2, page 142. Quote, Some free agents you will observe, such as they that were credited by God, continued in those things for which God uh, had made and over which God had ordained them. But some outraged both the constitution of their nature and the government entrusted to them, namely this ruler of matter in its various forms and others of those who were placed about the firmament. These fell into impure love of virgins and were subjugated by the flesh, and he became ne uh, negligent and wicked in the management of the things entrusted him. Of these lovers of virgins, therefore, were begotten of those who are called giants. And if something has been said by the poets too about giants, be not surprised at this. And again, uh, what they're dealing with here is they're dealing with fallen angels, angels that came down to earth, came into the daughters of men. Uh, Methodius, in two, he lived from uh, 260 to 312 A.D. Here's what he says. The devil is a spirit made by God in the neighborhood of matter, as of course the rest of the angels are, and that he was entrusted with the oversight of matter and the forms of matter. But the devil was insolvent and having conceived envy of us, behaved wickedly in the charge committed to him, as also did those angels who subsequently were enamored of fleshly charms and had illicit intercourse with the daughters of men. Volume 6, page 368. The writings of Justin Martyr, book 1, page 190, on how the angels transgressed. Another long quote, but please bear, bear witness with me here. Stay with me. I said bear witness. Stay with me and bear with me, I meant to say, because I want you to really get these quotes so that you'll know that what Brother Stone is teaching is not something I've concocted it's not a theory I've come up with. It's something that really was known and accepted and believed all the way back in the time of Jesus Christ that these fallen angels took upon themselves the forms of men, came into the daughters of men and bore these giants. This was accepted back in that day as fact. Let's keep reading. Justin Martyr, book 1, page 190. God committed the care of men and all things under heaven to angels whom He appointed over them. But the angels transgressed this appointment and were captivated by the love of women and begot children who were those that are called demons. Notice that. And besides, they afterwards subdued the human race to themselves partly by teaching them to offer sacrifices and incense and libations of which they stood in need after they were enslaved by lustful passions. And among them... Among humans, they sowed murders, wars, adulteries, uh, intemperate deeds, and all wickedness. Whence also the poets and mythologists, not knowing that it was the angels and those demons whom had been begotten by them, did these things to men and women in cities and nations, which they related, ascribed them to God Himself and to the offspring of those who were called brothers, Neptune and Pluto, and to the children again, of these their offspring. For whatever name each of the angels had given himself and his children, by that name they were called. Justin Martyr, book 1, page 190. Now he says something interesting here because, you know, the Greeks talk about Hercules and Pluto, and Neptune and all these other gods, mythological gods. His implication here is that the fallen angels had those names and took upon themselves those names and those names became the gods that the Greek worshipped and in their mythology. And once again, I would say to you that mythology is a vast corruption, a vast, vast, vast corruption of the real truth and the real thing. Clement of Alexander, book, uh, book 8, chapter 6, page 272. Here's what he says. For the spirits who inhabit the heaven, the angels who dwell in the lowest region, being grieved at the ingratitude of men to God, ask that they might into, they might into the life of men that is, by becoming men, uh, by more intercourse, they might convict those who had ha acted ungratefully toward Him. In other words, the angels were upset that men had sinned. They were upset that men were not uh, being faithful to God, and they were grieved about it, and they said, we want to go down there and be like men so that we can teach them what is right. And this, again, is a theme that seems to follow a lot of the early church fathers' writings. But then having assumed these forms, they convicted as covetous those who 
stole them and changed themselves into the nature of men in order that uh, living ho uh, holily and showing the possibility of so living, they might subject the ungrateful to punishment. Yet, having become in all respects men, they also partook of human lust, and being brought under its subjection, they fell into cohabitation with women. And being involved with them, for the fire itself extinguished by the weight of lust and changed into the flesh, they trove the impious path, toward, uh, path downward. Of course, it gets a little wordy there at the end, but there again, uh, we find out that Clement of Alexander talks about again how that these angels wanted to come down to earth to teach men righteousness, and they became angry with men not obeying God. They came down, took upon themselves the form of flesh, fell into lust with women who apparently just were enthralled by them, enamored by them, and went into the daughters of men, produced this race of giants, and again, these giants taught corruption to mankind. It's real interesting because, you know, if you think about this for a moment, if you go from the time of the creation of Adam to the time of the flood of Noah, for example, as I said earlier, and you read the genealogies of those ten men that were born from Adam to Noah, uh, these men knew each other. They had sons. They were, they were actually trying to teach men righteousness, no doubt about it. What caused the corruption of mankind on the earth? Well, it was man's sin nature. Well, I agree with that. But something happened to cause men's imagination to become so wicked, to cause perversion to become so great that God said, I am going to kill men. I'm going to wipe out the whole planet because the perversion and the corruption is so great. And I believe it was not just because that men's imaginations were wicked. I believe the reason God wanted to destroy the earth was the giants were becoming so great in the earth. Read Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4. They were becoming so great in the earth and they were populating the earth to the point and teaching such corruption and such wicked perversion thoughts of adultery, fornication, and uh, wicked imaginations. God had to destroy them. And I think that is really what helped bring about the flood, to be honest with you. And I've studied this in detail, was the race of giants, the seed of the serpent. Remember that? The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, the seed of the serpent. The serpent has a seed. And uh, I believe, again, it was this race of giants. Now, Clement of Alexander also adds in a section called Their Discoveries that uh, the fallen angels taught the use of metals, precious stones, charms, magic, astrology, and were called demons bound in the flesh. Listen to that statement now. Demons bound in the flesh. In chapter 15, under the, under the giants, we read, this is another quote from early church father, but from their unhallowed intercourse, spurious men sprang, much greater in stature than ordinary men, whom they afterward called giants. Not those dragon-footed dragon giants who waged war against God, as the blasphemous myths of the Greeks do sing, but wild in manners and greater than men in size, inasmuch as they were sprung of angels, yet less than angels, as they were born of women." Let's go on with these quotes. I have two more. The book of Jubilees, chapter 5, 1 through 6. And it came to pass when the sons of men began to increase on the earth, and daughters were born to them, that in the first year of the Jubilee, the angels of God looked on them and saw that they were beautiful. And they took wives from as many of them as they chose. And they bore them sons, and they became giants. And against the angels... He had uh, sent on earth. His anger was so great that he uprooted them from their dominion and commanded us to imprison them in the depths of the earth. And behold, they are there in prison. Uh, behold, they are in prison there and separate. And of course, if we, which we will in a moment, we're going to read from Jude and Second Peter, which tells us that fallen angels uh, are bound in uh, Tartarus, which is a chamber of hell in the lower parts of the earth. And uh, apparently, Jubilees five one through six speaks about this. Now, the Ethiopian version of the book of Enoch. And once again, I told you earlier, I'm using different sources here to help you get a broad picture of what was believed 1800, 1900, 2000, 2100 years ago. We're trying to give you that picture. The book of Enoch. Further, God said to Raphael, Bind Azalel by his hands and his feet, and, and split open the desert which is in uh, Dudel, and throw him in there, and cover him with darkness, and let him stay there forever, that on the day of judgment he may be hurled into the fire. And God said unto Michael, this is Michael the archangel, Go inform Shem Yazah and the other with him. When all their sons kill each other, and when they see the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them for seventy generations under the hill of the earth, 
until the day of judgment. And in those days they would lead them to the abyss of fire. Now what's interesting about this quote from the Ethiopian version of the book of Enoch is that it mentions Azazel, which Azazel, according to Jewish belief, was the name of the scapegoat uh, on the Day of Atonement once a year. Now, now I, I, that, that the priest would lay his hands on that goat, goat and send that goat into the wilderness. You may have heard us talk, uh, teach about that. I remember asking some of the men at the Temple Institute at one time uh, about Azazel, and they said it was a name of a fallen angel or a name of Satan. And of course, here it teaches it was the name of a fallen angel. Secondly, it talks about how that they split open the desert and we know that evil spirits, according to Luke's gospel, walk through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Number three, it mentions they're, uh, they're bound under the earth till the day of judgment. We'll show you that is what the scripture does teach. And also it mentions the abyss of fire here. And we know that Satan's final doom in Revelation 20 is the bottomless pit, the abusos in Greek, or the abyss. And so even though this uh, book of Enoch is not considered to be inspired scripture, it does give you some of the same ideas which are taught in the inspired word of God about fallen angels. All right, now, let's get to this summary here. Okay, let's put this thing together. I tell you, oh, it's getting interesting. But we still haven't got to the main uh, punchline yet, I guess you'd call it. I don't know what you call it. The main theme of this whole thing to help you understand the spiritual realm that we're talking about here. Here's what, in summary, that we can, we can, we can summarize in everything that we've brought you and the information we've given you up to this present point. Number one, it does appear angels came down to earth in the form of flesh. And uh, this is the reason why the ancient Sumerians said gods came down. This is why they talk about the gods coming down from planets and the gods coming down to earth because literally they were angels that came down and to many people who would not have understood the things of God, maybe from another religion, they would have just been considered gods coming down. All right, number two, these angels, when they took upon themselves the form of flesh, became attracted to women and we're able to have intercourse with them. I know what you're thinking. Angels can't do that. Just stay with me. I said we're going to answer that in a moment. And number three, when they had intercourse with the daughters of men, they produced an abnormal race which was called giants. Now the common Hebrew word is Nephilim. Nephilim. And they produced the Nephilim. And if you read the Hebrew Bible where it says giants, in many instances it will say Nephilim. And uh, these giants, of course, uh, corrupted mankind and eventually had to be destroyed off of the face of the earth. Now, here's what the Bible teaches about the race of fallen uh, angels. And you see, I could have I done this first, read the scripture first, and then given you the quotes, but I wanted to give you those quotes and let that kind of sink in. And you'll probably have to rewind the tape two or three times just to get all the quotes and get the details of them. But here's what the Bible teaches now about fallen angels. In the book of Jude, uh, it only has one chapter, but verse 6 and 7, the Bible says... And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. In the NIV, I always use the King James Version, but in the NIV, here's what it says. And the angels who did not keep their promise of authority, positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. And of course, some of the uh, books that we quoted from in early church fathers do mention the same thing. Now, Peter talks about fallen angels. Here's what he says. Again, I want to, uh, I think in, um, let me give you the reference here. I believe it's in, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't write the reference down actually. 2 Peter, I believe it's chapter 2. Uh, it talks about, for if God spared not the angels that sin, but sent them into hell, putting them in gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. That's the NIV. Uh, I think the King James says, For God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down in chains of darkness into hell unto the judgment of the great day. The word hell there is a Greek word, Tartarus. Uh, it's one of the very few places where that word is found in the New Testament. Usually the, the New Testament word hell is usually the Greek word Gehenna. But in this instance, it's Tartarus. Now Tartarus is the lowest of the lowest chamber in the heart of the earth where the most wicked spirits are bound. And this, of course, was a teaching among the Greeks, and it's a word which is a Greek word, by the way, used in the New Testament there in 2 Peter for the word hell. So the, the fallen angels then are bound in chains where they're not permitted to be loosed or free, and they're bound in chains of darkness unto the day of judgment, and they're bound in a place called Tartarus, which is the lowest compartment of, of the earth. And the reason that they are bound is because they did not keep their first estate. They did not keep their first position of authority. They did not keep what their assignment was. Apparently, from the early church father's writings, 
And these were men, again, when I say early church fathers' writings, these were men from the first, second, and third century. Uh, Christian men in the early church who were considered bishops. They were considered leaders. Bishop of Alexander, Bishop of Rome, Bishop of Syria, whatever. And they were considered the doctrinal leaders of the early church. These men apparently had this understanding that these fallen angels produced this offspring that we now call giants, that the Hebrew word calls Nephilim, these very, very huge, very, very large men. And of course, when you look at this, you also see that the angels that caused this, that went into the intercourse of the daughters of men, God had them removed. And uh, of course, one of the writers uh, mentions that Michael the archangel did this, but had these fallen angels removed off of the earth where they could not keep producing this race of giants, had those fallen angels taken to the bowels of the earth. We don't know exactly how many there are there. And there they are in Tartarus where they are bound in chains of darkness. Now, you know, a, a lot of people may be saying, man, I never knew all of that was in the Bible. Well, I didn't either until I began to really dig and research. You know, you'd be surprised what you can really find. You, you take the scripture, you take history, you take the early church fathers, you take the rabbinical teachings and you start tying it together and you can get a real picture of real spirit warfare a real picture of what all this is about. Now, there again, we have two questions. Question number one that people often ask is, why in the world did God allow Satan to come into the Garden of Eden? Why didn't God just kill Satan? Why did He allow him to come into the Garden of Eden? Because, because number one, sin was already in the universe. Satan was already a fallen being. And because sin was in the universe, God had to give man a choice. And that's why Satan was there. Number two, the question comes, why did God allow these angels to come down? if they were fallen angels. They did not come down in a fallen state. There is no record that these particular angels... Now, we do know there's a third of the angels that fell with Satan. Uh, these, the third... I've got to make this clear. This is coming to me right now. The third of the angels in Revelation 12 that fell with Satan that were cast out to the earth are different from the angels we're talking about here because those angels that fell with Satan became the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the wicked spirits in heavenly places. They basically make up the kingdom of Satan now. There are, so there's, there's a group of fallen angels that remained with Satan, but there's a group of fallen angels that came down before the flood of Noah and after the flood of Noah. Before the flood, they simply came down to teach men righteousness. And, of course, at the time of the flood, God took them. So another group of... Uh, now, this is in Jewish history. We can assume that they have some knowledge of this handed down by tradition. 200 of them came down on Mount Hermon in Israel to teach men righteousness in that land of the covenant. And they too sinned. And of course, at some point, we don't know exactly when, they were taken off of the earth. And so therefore, it, what happened was the race of giants was totally uh, annihilated and totally destroyed in the time of David. Hopefully, we'll be able to mention that in just a moment. And so, what I want you to see is the fallen angels that we're talking about here that are bound in chains of darkness are not necessarily those that fell with Satan in Revelation 12. Those that fell with Satan are called Satan and his angels. And they are active during the tribulation period. These that are bound in Tartarus are bound unto the judgment of the, of the great day or to the day of judgment. And those that are bound in Tartarus at this present point are those who came into the daughters of men and produced the race of giants. So actually, to be honest with you, when we talk about angels, we have three groups of angels. We have one group of angels that are still with God, ministering spirits, cherubim, seraphim, etc., living creatures. We have uh, a group of angels that are now bound under the earth called the fallen angels, 2 Peter chapter 2 and also there in Jude chapter 1. And then we have angels that are presently working with Satan, Revelation chapter 12, which are principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, wicked spirits in heavenly places. Now, this strange event of how angels uh, uh, took upon themselves the form of flesh, went into the daughters of men and produced giants, became a basis for later... Uh, what would formulate in what was called Greek mythology. And I do not believe in Greek mythology, by the way. You need to understand none of my teaching, none of what I'm teaching today has any basis or any foundation or any quotes out of what we call mythology or Greek mythology. We're using uh, material which was known by the early church fathers, quoted by the early church fathers, quotes of the early church fathers themselves. We're using scripture. We're putting all this stuff together in one one packet to help you understand, again, the history of that time, what people understood back then that we don't understand today. Now, watch this carefully. There are probably many of you that are saying, as I did when I first studied this, I said, wait a minute, how can angels take upon themselves the form of men, and how can they have physical relations with the daughters of men? And I know probably through this whole teaching, if you know anything about the Bible, you have been sitting there in your uh, apartment or home, uh, maybe riding in a van. Uh, watching this uh, through a television, the VCR, but you're saying to yourself, now, Brother Stone, how is that possible? Let's answer that question in about three parts. Number one,
Can angels take upon themselves different forms? The answer is yes. Psalms 104.4, angels are spirits. Psalms, uh, Hebrews 1.14, uh, angels are, are ministering spirits, but they are also invisible. They cannot be seen to the natural eye. But yet, when we read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, it says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for whereby some have entertained angels unaware. Because an angel is a spirit being, it has the capability of taking on itself a form. Now remember at the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew, uh, Matthew's gospel, does it not say that the Holy Spirit, member of the Godhead, triune Godhead, that the Holy Spirit descended upon Christ in the form of a dove. Now when they looked up at the Jordan River, they did not see a man descending on Jesus. They saw the form of a dove and they recognized it as the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit being a spirit, could take upon himself the form of a dove. Therefore, we have to understand because, you know, when we deal with angels and we deal with spirits, we're dealing with an entirely different realm than what you and I are familiar with. We're familiar with the natural and the flesh. We're talking about the spirit realm here. So they can take upon themselves other forms. And we also know from Hebrews 13 that they can actually take upon themselves the form of human beings. Is that, is that found elsewhere in the Bible? Absolutely. Number one. There were angels that came into Abraham's tent in Genesis chapter 18, and the men thought these were angels, uh, these angels were actually men, and they looked like men. They didn't look like angels with uh, glowing in white with wings. They looked like men, and they came to Abraham's tent. The same two men who were actually angels in Genesis 19 verse 1 went to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the men, they must have been handsome because the men who were the Sodomites knocked on the door and wanted to have relations with these men. We find out that Jacob wrestled a man till the breaking of day, Genesis 32, 24 through 30. He wrestled him physically, but we also find out that it was an angel of the Lord. So there again, that Old Testament time, these angels of God were taking on the appearances of men. Uh, in the Dakes Bible, in, in the New Testament, page 225, he records that there were 104 appearances of angels to men and women throughout the Scripture. Now, number three, and here's the part that we really have to get into. Can angels function as human beings are able to function when they take upon themselves human flesh? The, the best way for me to answer that is to answer it this way. When we read the Bible, we discover that the Word of God was made flesh. Jesus was made flesh. Jesus was pre-incarnate with the Father, existed with the heaven. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus Christ was made flesh. Now, according to Hebrews 2.18 and Hebrews 4.15, Christ, when He took upon Himself flesh... Now here's, let me go back. The Bible said, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth He any man, because God is a spirit, and God is holy, and God is righteous. But when, when, when the God-man Jesus Christ took upon Himself the form of flesh, the Bible says, He was tempted in all points as you and I, yet without sin. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, at the temptation of Jesus, He is tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And those are the three main tools that Satan uses to test and tempt mankind. So we see here, I want you to understand this, we see here that Jesus Christ literally was tempted in all points. And in the Greek it reads, in all forms. He was tempted from the whole. In other words, totally and completely. Anything that you could experience as a form of temptation, Christ Himself could experience that. So here's the question I want to ask you. Could Jesus Christ, when He was in a physical body, have sinned physically? And the answer is unequivocally, absolutely yes, or the Bible's not true. And the Bible said, He was tempted in all points as you and I. That means that Jesus may have looked at a woman and had a thought come into His mind. Now, He didn't sin, He cast it out. But He could have physically... Well, look, He ate, He slept, He became tired, He became angry. All the emotions that men had, Jesus had. But yet... Christ existed in heaven with the Father at the creation of the heavens and the earth. But when He took upon Himself the form of flesh, He was subject to the powers of that flesh when He took upon Himself that form. We also know that angels, according to Genesis 18, 1 through 8, uh, they ate with Abraham. We know that even God came down and ate with the 70 elders of Israel on top of the mountain. That's found in the book of Exodus. So when we see this, we understand, okay, number one, angels can take upon themselves forms. Number two, they can at times take upon themselves the form of humans. And number three, uh, they can function in all aspects as a human does once they take upon themselves the form. Yeah, but Brother Stone, doesn't the Bible say, Revelation, uh, Matthew 22 and 30, for in the resurrection, that's talking about when we are raised from the dead and given a glorified body, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now notice this again. 
Here is a verse that people use to try to just throw all this out the window. I don't believe any of that. The Bible says the angels in heaven are not married nor given in marriage. Therefore, they can't have any relations. Notice this. Number one, he talks about the angels of God in heaven. They are, they are not fleshly in heaven. They are spirit beings. They are ministering spirits. They are spirits of, uh, uh, you know, the Bible says he make, maketh his angels uh, spirits and his ministers of flame and fire. They are in heaven. In the heavenly form there is no marriage nor given in marriage because spirit beings in a spirit being form do not have relations. We're not talking about this in heaven as they are in heaven. We're talking about when they took upon themselves the form of flesh on earth. Now I'll give you something to think about. Hey, hey, hey. I'll give you something to think about. What if I were to tell you there's one reference in the Bible where there are angels that look like women? I said that in the church one time. I thought a riot was going to break out. I'll tell you one thing, you can't prove that from the Bible. Well, I showed the person and they didn't know what to think. In Zechariah chapter 5 verse 9, here's what it says. Then lifted I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings. Now, you know, normal women don't have wings. For they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the eat. Well, I say normal women don't have wings. My wife's a little angel. She don't have wings. They lifted up an ephod between earth and the heaven. Now, notice this. Here in this reference of Zechariah chapter 5, they're not called angels, but they're called women, and yet they have wings. Now, that shouldn't seem too odd to us because in the New Testament, angels were called men. In Luke chapter 24, verse 4, the men that were at the tomb of Jesus were actually angels, but yet it says two men were there. Acts chapter 1, verse 10. Two men in white apparel stood by saying, Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus will come back again. So in the book of uh, Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1, we find that there are actual angels, and the Bible calls them men because even though they're dressed in white, they have the appearance of an actual man. And I'm not going to make a big issue about Zechariah chapter 5, verse 9, and and the, the women, you know, I, this, is what, this is what made me think about this. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not saying you have to agree or disagree with this. I don't, uh, I guess it's just a matter of opinion. But when, when Jesus said in heaven, they are like the angels, plural. They are neither married nor given in marriage. I'm thinking of all the angels in heaven look like men or are quote unquote male. Why would Jesus even say that? Why didn't he say, well, they're just like the angels in heaven. You know, the angels in heaven, they're all men. There's no marriage up there.